Uh, so, hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Vince Dion. I am VE6 Lima Kilo. I carry American call sign as well. I am coming to you live uh, from Okotoks, Alberta. Now, if you believe the, mo the marketing people in Okotoks, there's lots to do in Okotoks. It's a great small town. It's located south of Calgary. Of course, now it's a little quieter. I'm uh, delighted to be able to um, be here uh, today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, special thanks to our friends from uh, ICOM that have uh, brought along an awesome presenter. And a special thanks to all of you for taking out the time to celebrate World Amateur Radio Day with us. Today I want to talk to you about, uh, to VNA or not VNA, with apologies to William Shakespeare, that's the question. Um, haven't, haven't we all wanted to build up I'm waiting for the mouse. There we go. Build up a great big antenna farm of some sort. And, and you take a look at my QRZ.com page and I say that there's plans are perpetually underway for a larger antenna farm. Um, it, it, they're, they're fun to play with and, and networks, uh, RF networks are certainly very interesting. The, um, the thing that, that makes it, uh, that gives us that best diagnosis and of course keeps our transmitters happy is low SWR and everybody thinks one-to-one -one SWR is kind of where it's at. That's another discussion for another day. But what I wanted to talk about today was the key differences between a scalar network analyzer and a vector network analyzer. And I'd, I'd like to ask for a show of hands. That becomes a little bit difficult, but I'm pretty well betting most of you have an SWR meter in your shack. And so you have a scalar network analyzer by definition. It measures mismatch, impedance, or gain, but it's only magnitude and not necessarily the circuit phase. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule, so I'm using some broad brush general statements. Um, a VSWR meter is one form of an SNA. Um, a vector network analyzer device, it measures both resistance and the phase of the circuit and the gain between the two ports on the device, because they're two-port devices. You've, uh, by now, many of us have seen that nano VNA uh, thing that's going around. I had one in my hands for a little bit of time. I found it tremendously tiny to use. Um, an interesting experimentation platform for sure. Uh, but a VNA, it measures both the resistance and the phase of the circuit and the gain between those two ports. Used to measure impedance, insertion loss, and return loss. So how do you recognize one of these things in the wild when you run across it? Well, usually they've got a couple of connectors on them. Um, and there's some exceptions to that. So in the SNA side of the slide, you can see our friend uh, in the lower left corner, the, uh, the MFJ looks like a 269C, very popular antenna analyzer. And it's got a few connectors on the top. Uh, looks like a grounding screw and an N connector and a BNC connector sitting there. That uh, BNC connector is actually to be used for um, uh, uh, frequency sensing. So they're not always, uh, uh, they don't always have two connectors on them, always have one, let me try that again, they don't always have one connector on them. Uh, in the upper left corner, of course, is you know a, a very popular sort of uh, field SWR meter that measures uh, forward and reflected. Um, and then we have our friend, uh, the reg expert, and the reg experts are, are some of those hybrid devices that have some SNA-like or VNA-like capabilities, but they appear to be an SNA visually. Let's contrast that now to the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, the, uh, the Agilent or the Enritsu uh, VNA in the top corner with a plethora of functions and uh, a plethora of, of commas after the dollar sign. Um, it, it does everything, and as as uh, the the old expression goes, it uh, slices and dices, and uh, does everything you'd want it to. Just below that is uh, one of the one of the nano VNAs that's out on the market. There are many different versions of the nano VNA. Uh, there's uh, the mini VNA Tiny, and they come in various form factors. You're kind of wondering where the screen is on that. Where's the display and the buttons? Uh, well, that one's designed to just be hooked up to your computer and to be driven by software. And then immediately to its left is uh, um, the one that I use out of the bunch. I, I don't know that it's the best or whatever, but it's the one that I chose. Um, I wanted a lightweight uh, field vector network analyzer that I could take out with me that was reasonably durable, that allowed me to do uh, work in the field. And that's the platform I settled on, uh, good, bad, or otherwise. 
So as Dana said, this is meant to be an interactive presentation. Uh, every once in a while, I'm going to divert my, uh, my view over that way to uh, take a look at the chat window and see if uh, I have any questions popping up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Apparently, so Loki2 has found a way to connect a Nano VNA to a Samsung, so that sounds pretty interesting. To a Samsung phone, probably, yeah. Those Nano VNAs have uh, little Bluetooth modules in them. Um, the VNA that I'm going to show you in a few minutes has one of those as well. I can drive it from uh, an Android device. I own one Android device in my fleet, um, and it's it's kind of interesting uh, to be able to hook up to it that way for sure. So, the you know, the the base question that I want to talk about here today is, are both types good for analyzing antennas? Uh-huh. Any other questions? It's pretty straightforward, right? They can help you analyze antennas um, no matter how complex or how simple the structure, the tape measure dipole uh, up in the upper right corner. Um, it looks like the dew line with all those uh, log periodics on, uh, on towers and a whole bunch of snow. Um, I'm not sure what's down in the lower right corner, but I really like the look of the photo. So I'll admit I included it for that reason alone. And then uh, a two to 11 gigahertz um, log periodic uh, mounted just on an SMA connector in the, uh, in the lower left. Of course, you have to consider as you take a look at any of these devices, their operating range and what they're capable of doing and the dynamic range uh, r around those as well. Um, many of the inexpensive VNAs or SNAs uh, are marketed uh, with range, ranges from DC to light, ranges from DC to five gigahertz. But the reality is the dynamic range, the range in which they are uh, accurate is only good to DC to 500 megahertz or something like that. So watch your specs carefully when you go to purchase one. The uh, one question, uh, and actually you kind of hit it there, um, are there other things that would cause error in an SWR meter event? Uh, there are all kinds of things that can cause error in an SWR meter, and it's probably the one piece of equipment in our shack that we don't pay enough attention to and calibrate uh, on a, an ongoing basis with a known source of power and a known good uh, test load. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so a question from the chat window. Uh, good morning, Joel. Uh, I am using the Metro VNA. Uh, the exact model number is, oh, oh, it is the Metro VNA. Excuse me, I had that right. Uh, from Metro Power, it's an Italian manufacturer. And so why use one over the other? Well, an SNA, it gives us some simple direct results. Maybe that's good enough for your purpose. Maybe you want to understand uh, the antenna that you're putting on your car, what corner you want to put it on. Uh, to get the best SWR. You're putting a mag mount up for an event. Sometimes we don't think about these things. We drop it on the corner of the trunk and um, we wonder why net control can't hear us all the time. So with an analyzer, you can drop it on the trunk and you can experiment with different locations on that. I'll show you that in a little bit in a demo. Um, so, it, but an SNA gives you some really simple direct results. Maybe that's good enough. And for the example of is my SWR good for my antenna that has been tested and, and I know that it's resonant on the frequencies that I want it to be on? Is it uh, going to give me the best SWR if I locate it here? That's perfect. And a VNA is much more versatile. It gives a much richer set of results than an SNA cannot. But it is at the expense of being more complex to use. And these, uh, these nano VNAs um, that are coming out today now, uh, many people, as I watch social media and I watch discussion boards and discussion forums, uh, many people are asking some rather simple questions. And there, there are procedures in order to use a VNA correctly, like calibrating it with cables and always use the same cables and use the same connectors all of the time. All of these things matter um, to get proper, consistent and repeatable test results. So what else can you do with a VNA? Well, that's the cool thing is you can do all kinds of stuff with it. One of the, the very first assignments that was given to me from the Foothills Amateur Radio Society, um, shout out to a, a guy south of Calgary. Um, they asked me to verify their open and short tuning stubs. So typically we take a, a spool of coax. We take a spool of coax like our friend here. Whoops, get it away from the camera a little bit more. 
uh, and we have an open on one end or a short on one end, and that's a quarter wavelength long of the target frequency, and we use those as either um, notch or notch reject or pass filters uh, when we're operating multi-station. And there's a way that you can tune those um, by using a VNA that's quite simple. Those ones in particular, you can also get close with an SNA, but you can get bang on with a VNA. Uh, alignment of filter cavities. Have you ever wondered the magic behind a repeater site and how you can have so many frequencies going out concurrently on an antenna? Those things are called cavities and they're pure black magic, but to me, they're pure black magic. To many people who understand them, they're a little more easy to, to figure out. But a VNA allows us to tune those filter cavities. I'll give you a quick demo on that in a little bit. Uh, you can use the data to build a matching network. You can get your Smith chart displays up, which give you a, a visual of the complex impedance. Um, you can test your duplexer or diplexer, you know, show of hands how many of us have a radio that's got a UHF port and a VHF port on it, on the back of it, but we only have one antenna coming out of it. So we get a, a duplexer or diplexer to combine those two to run out on a single line. Uh, you can check the length of a cable and many, many more. So let me get into some demos here and we'll, uh, we'll transition the video just a little bit so that I can get set up for it. The uh, first thing I want to do is I want to show you what the result is of uh, opening up um, of doing a, a short and open detect on that coil of cable I was just showing you a minute ago. So, the camera set up here so that you can see what I'm doing here's my test lab my test lab is simple it's that same coil of cable and you can see that I've got it fed out here and my uh, VNA is off to the right and what I've got going on is I've got this software so this software is uh, running on one of my computers it's um, VNAJ it's a Java based application uh, so I keep it on a virtual machine that I don't do anything else with uh, because it's Java. Uh, there are many different freeware type applications available for SNAs. So um, you can see on your screen, uh, I don't expect you to be able to read the numbers on the screen because they're pretty tiny. Um, I might need some new glasses and I'm sitting in front of the screen just to make a little fun out of it. But you'll note that in the middle of the screen right now, there's a peak. And so I'm gonna scan and let's see what uh, the scan result says. So I'm just measuring SWR and the peak stays in the middle of the screen. So now what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll come over here and let's clip this shut. And I'll use my very famous Kelly clamps because I ran out of alligator clips. And now let's run the scan again and see what the difference is. Well, that's pretty notable right there, hey? So now, have you ever done a mobile installation and it's not quite working right, and the SWR isn't what you think it is? Well, here's an easy way to tell whether you've got an open or a short in your circuit, uh, rather than having the SWR dipping where you expect it to. An open or a short shows up as uh, very simply waves. Uh, let me open it back up again and show you the difference. So we can take a look at it and we can see multiple different waves coming in and one is totally opposite uh, to the other. Um, so that's a real quick, easy way to, uh, to take a look at that. Now, let me kind of set up for the next uh, demo. So now I've got my friend, uh, the resonance cavity. Uh, it's got an inny and an outie, as uh, Peter Rizdahl would say. Uh, thanks, uh, shout out to Peter Rizdahl, the six kilo kilo, who helped me to, uh, to build this presentation. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure uh, my return loss uh, and nothing else. And I'm going to switch the mode to transmission. And what this does is in, a, in an SNA, normally the, um, the, the detecting signal goes out the port and it's reflected back and it's measured. In a VNA, I can do it that way and use it effectively as an SNA, or in this case, in the transmission mode, I'm going to go out on one port and come back in on the other. So when I run a single scan on this particular can, on this particular cavity, and that's not what I'm after, I'm after return. 
return loss. Let me try this again. Demos always work perfectly when you set them up, but when you go to do them live, as any of you know, um, they become a different matter entirely. There we go. So I am hoping that what I'll be able to do with you today, I'm gonna to leave this on running now. And as I adjust the length of the rod, I hopefully should be able to move that nice big dip on the right hand side of the screen down. Don't we hate it when a demo doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So we're gonna try that again. That was working earlier this morning. It was just awesome when it was too, I might add. What I've done to make the, uh, the screen appear a little bit goofy like that is I've widened the scanning range. It's running from 100 to 180 megahertz. My particular analyzer can uh, go up to 250 megahertz. So what we should really clearly see as I move uh, the rods up and down, which adjust the space inside the cavity is I should be able to see these curves moving along with it. Well, this is what happens when a demo doesn't work. I'm going to have to ask you folks to all trust my smiling face when I say, normally when I line up a canister, uh, line up a cavity, that it works a little bit better for me. But the idea is to take the rods and adjust them in such a way that I can move that curve down to where I need it to get to the, the notch or the dip uh, on the spectrum analyzer so that I can make the cavity do what I need it to do. Let me set up for the uh, third demo. So earlier on, I was talking about um, what happens when we've got uh, our friend the um, our friend the our friend the uh, quarter wave antenna out on the car, and we're trying to figure out uh, exactly what the SWR is going to be of it. So you can see what I've got for I've got a ground plane here. I've got some uh, magnetic wall tack strips here that um, about 18 inches long. They're a little bit too short for two meters. There we go. They're bolted up in the middle and they serve as uh, real fine uh, rapid deployment um, antenna ground planes if, if a little bit small. And so we'll do a couple of simple tests here. First off, what I want to do is I want to go back to the analyzer and I want to ratchet in the range a little bit. We're going to look at SWR and I'll do it as a simple reflection scan. And we can see that the SWR is kind of all over the map. So have you ever wondered what's the effect of getting your hand in the near field on an antenna? So as I sweep my hand along, you'll see that the range on, you'll see that the range on it changes. Of course, that's once I hook up the antenna. Like I say in rehearsal, demos always go perfectly, but in real life, we uh, get something else entirely. Even for digital TV, if you hold your hand to the right spot on the rabbit ears, it might actually help. You know, yeah, you never know, Dana. All right, so let's get the curve. There we go. That's what I was looking to see. I love it when a plan finally does come together. So, boy, oh boy, you ever wonder what the effect of putting your body near an antenna is? What we've done is, in this case, with moving that dip to the right on the screen, is we've moved that resonance point uh, much higher. Uh, I'm sure it would show a whole wealth of information if we were to, to bring that up on a Smith chart. And as I move it along uh, the antenna, it uh, lowers uh, the resonant feed point, of course. 
So that's one thing to note. Now, if we take a look at what happens, so we all, all of us Aries guys, we carry around a cookie sheet of some sort. And this is the one I use when I'm building things because it keeps, I, I throw all the parts inside here that I'm soldering up and they never roll off the edge of my bench. That's so what happens with our curve. Keep your eye on that curve for a minute. If we put it in the middle of a pie plate, well, we can see that. But now let's take a peek at the um, take a peek at the antenna analyzer itself. We'll compare some things. That's the view that I want. I'm gonna have to reset my analyzer. Live demos are great, aren't they, folks? We, we realized in the uh, practice that uh, I think I finally discovered a secret is that the master bakers, they must actually tune their pans for resonance. Yes. Yeah. And we'll see that in just a minute. And so I, I, I don't have enough flour around, but maybe I'll try some baking later. Um, usually got to be careful sneaking things out of the wife's kitchen. <laughs> All right. So. Let's see, that's in the middle of a baking sheet that is not 19 inches in every direction. And that's at a VHF frequency, so we can see the SWR very clearly there. Is a two point something, almost three. And all of a sudden, if I start laying my hands around it, does it affect that SWR a bunch? Yeah, it does uh, the closer I get to the tip of the antenna, of course. Um, this is a demo antenna I use, which is why it's got all these crazy flags on it. If I had some RF going through it, a little red light would light up. So that's all good. Now, somebody said to me the other day that I did this demo the once, and they said it was, it was quite a difference when they saw uh, the how the placement of an antenna on the ground plane affects the SWR. And sure enough, what I was talking to a bit earlier on was the, uh, the location of it and um, and how you would tune for uh, best use. And so if we are, if we take that antenna and kind of casually put it out on the edge of the ground plane, on the edge of the trunk, if you will, for a, uh, for an event, well, gee, what does that do to the, um, what does that do to the resonance? Well, gee, it, or the SWR, it looks just awful, right? Uh, as we bring it back towards the center, a little bit closer. And I have no idea what's behind the, the hidden curtain hiding the mess on my uh, workbench. I'm sure there's a few metallic objects, but again, for purpose of demo, this is just, this is just fine and dandy. Oh, put it in the middle of the ground plane, and all of a sudden, look at the SWR. Well, what does that tell us from a, a placement perspective? If we're setting up really quick for uh, a field event with a mag mount antenna like this, we want to get it as close to the middle of the ground plane as possible. So does more metal make for better SWR? Well, we can find out that answer pretty quick. Take my hand away, hmm, maybe a tiny, tiny bit. And then if we just return back to the pie plate, nope, that's too uh, that's too small in every direction, right? So we could sit we could sit and play with this all day. Not my intent. My intent today is to to introduce you to a couple of the things that uh, a VNA uh, can measure off uh, and help you with. I'm just going to look to the chat window for a moment and see if any questions have popped up. I think everybody's mesmerized with the demo right now. <laughs> um, and so Jeremy is asking what's, what might be the error factor in some SWR meters. And, and Jeremy, from my experience, uh, the error rate can be anything from uh, a few percent to a lot of percents, uh, 15 or 20. So um, if you have 
a question. Uh, so um, Confucius has this expression. Confucius say, man with watch knows what time it is. Man with two, never quite sure. Man with SWR bridge knows what his SWR is. Man with two, never quite sure. And so you'll have to have an instrument that you trust in order to verify the calibration of your SWR bridge or your uh, test equipment before you can be reliant upon it in any case. All right. Um, flipping back to the presentation. Any comments, Vince, about uh, S parameters? I know they've got like S11, S12, and oh. um, how do you figure out what, what those are? What does that mean? Oh, hey, that's a great question, Dana. Thanks. Let me, um, let me retrieve my gear from, uh, from the demo table. And actually, I'll just front, uh, flip to a full front camera view here for just a minute. So there's, uh, there's my VNA, and you can see nice and small, and, and that was one of the reasons I purchased it. And so there are the, the nomenclature on an SNA is port one, port two. So S11 says go out port one and come back port one. S12 says go out port one and come in port two, et cetera, et cetera. That's how that nomenclature works. Nice and simple. So by definition then, uh, with most SNAs having just one port, they're measuring S11 modes if they are vector-based analyzers. Not all single port devices are, some of them are, some of the rig experts, for example. Um, one question, if you know a uh, typical cost range for V&A devices, I know when I start looking at the mm -hmm. high-end ones, it's, oh, it's more than, than a house. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. And, and you know, I know there are uh, many people uh, that have joined our uh, conference today um, and, and welcome to all of you. Uh, many that have joined the conference that, are, uh, that work with VNAs far more often than I do. I'm a hobbyist enthusiast at best. The, uh, the price range for um, something, an appliance like this is uh, 450 Canadian dollars and, and up. Um, when I was shopping for mine, uh, I was seeing kits that one could build that were reasonably good based around the same chipset as this. Um, from memory, the SI5351, the, uh, I've, I saw kits at around $250 that required uh, the ability to know how to wave solder uh, large surface mount devices and, uh, and load code um, all the way up to uh, a couple thousand dollars. And certainly the bench quality equipment, uh, the, uh, the Hewlett Packard devices, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the world, um, just, just start putting commas in the numbers and uh, you get some idea that uh, the price of a small house uh, would be correct. Um, I'm getting my results and reasonably good field results close enough for me to know if I need to bring a piece of equipment back in from the field and put it across a spectrum analyzer or a service monitor uh, for $460 if memory serves. So yeah, definitely some becoming quite affordable. Um, does SWR yeah. change with uh, power equipment? Uh, SWR should not change with power output, but if you are seeing a change in SWR with power output, you have something else going on in your system. Maybe you've got a little bit of water in the feed line and it jumps across and it uh, starts reflecting back uh, with a higher power level. Pure speculation. Let's, um, let's come back here and uh, I'm pretty close to wrapping up. Um, the, uh, the information I had uh, to present to you folks today. Uh, once we post the slides, I, I believe it's our intention, uh, Kara's intention to post the slides. Uh, you'll see the, um, the source of uh, information and the reference material that uh, I've shared or that I based uh, uh, this presentation upon. Um, feel free to visit those links. Uh, certainly I've, I've spoken uh, about uh, the, uh, the Nano VNA uh, product a little bit. Um, I had one in my hands, it wasn't my cup of tea. It's an excellent experimenter's platform. I would never characterize it as being a, um, a platform that uh, we'd want um, uh, inexperienced folks to uh, go into and be fully reliant on their results, do a lot of reading on it. 
uh, take your time to learn about your device, be it one of these or one of those, uh, before you become reliant on it. It's a great experimental platform and certainly to do some really fast uh, SWR measurements. Um, yeah, you get you in the ballpark. I, I can't speak to its accuracy, but only for lack of experience. Uh, Dana, if there's no other questions in the chat window, um, I am at the end of uh, my presentation time slot. Thanks very much, folks. Uh, appreciate your time today. And thanks for letting me try to entertain you and fill in a bit of the gap. Um, I'm looking forward to what uh, John's got to say. I saw a sneak peek of it a few nights ago when, when we were doing rehearsal and he's a, a brilliant guy who uh, has a really great balanced view on uh, many things. So I'm sure you're in for a treat.